welcome on PCR TV. Uh, we are here at Euro PCR 2017 and this interview will be specifically dedicated on essentials for young practitioners and the topic we are discussing today is the management strategy of patients with heavily calcified coronary stenosis. I have the pleasure to discuss this interesting topic with uh, two friends and colleagues. Uh, I will start introducing uh, Joost Demon, who is the interventional cardiologist at the Thorax Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and with Fabio Mangiacapra, interventional cardiologist at the Campus Biomedical University in Rome, Italy. Fabio, let's start with you. And the first important thing I'd like to touch upon is the following one. It is not always easy, it is not always obvious uh, to recognize that we are uh, dealing with heavily calcified coronary stenosis. Can you, can you give a comment on that? Well, calcified coronary lesions are definitely one of the most complex scenarios that we can face in our daily practice in the, in the cath lab. And unfortunately, angiography is not always enough to clearly understand whether we are dealing with a severely calcified coronary lesions uh, because it's a two-dimensional imaging modality and uh, as such it doesn't give you uh, a complete view of what you're dealing with in terms of coronary anatomy and introducing some additional imaging modalities like intravascular imaging, IWUS or OCT uh, could help you with three-dimensional reconstructions and uh, will enable you to understand, for example, whether calcifications are circumferential or not. It uh, will give you a broader idea of the anatomy of these vessels, showing you the presence of the calcific nodules, which are those parts of the calcific tissue with the highest amount of calcium, really with bone formation nearly um, inside them. That's right. Just, we now identified our problem, we know that we are dealing with a challenging situation. What would be the best treatment strategy for this kind of patients and this kind of anatomy? Well, I think the best recommendations we can make at this stage is that you start with a setup you feel comfortable with. Choose a guide with decent support, choose the exit strategy you prefer the most. Radial is no problem unless you're comfortable. And then think about the fact that you might need rotablator. In case you do so, make sure you have everything set up correctly. Your team must be trained, you must be familiar with the device. And if so, the use of rotablator can be a very safe and very efficient procedure. So in our um, practice, the best way to proceed then is to look at the vessel, look at the anatomy, look at the amount of calcium, as Fabio already alluded to, um, see how much you need to do, and to decide on the burr size. First, you need to get a wire across. So think about the fact that this rotor wire is a very floppy wire, very easily kinks and very poorly steerable. So what we recommend in most cases is that you use your regular, maybe hydrophilic wire, get it across the lesion, use a microcatheter to advance and then over the microcatheter you advance the rotor wire. Usually saves you a lot of time and effort. Then second most important thing is think about the size of the burr. The rotor blader comes, as we all know, in sizes varying between 125 to 2.5. 125 goes to 6 French, for 2.5 you need 9 French. In our practice, and I think also in, in, in what we've seen thus far, the best results and the safest results you get by choosing a small burr. A 1.5 burr will do the trick in almost all the cases. And Hold on, I need to ask you something on this specific point, because I think this is key to understand. Why do you think that just with a 1.5 millimeter bar we will make the job? and will facilitate further treatment of the plaque. I mean, is it debulking efficient or, or what, do you, what is your opinion about I think about you're that? touching upon a very important issue here. Rotablator is not debulking the whole vessel. As you might know, rotablator uh, rotates at 150,000 RPMs, generates heat and it generates microparticles. The larger the burr, the higher the chance of complications, dissection, rupture and most importantly, no reflow. It's not about debulking, but it's usually about decreasing the rigidity of the calcium. As long as you scrape down the calcium a little bit, you will be able to dilate with a non-compliant balloon, crack the calcium and get an optimal stand expansion because at the end, as is what Fabio already alluded to, is the most important thing. It's not just about getting the stand across, it's getting about optimal result with proper expansion. That's right. Actually, you made your case quite clear. Fabio, the situation seems uh, pretty straightforward, but sometimes people is reluctant to use rotational thorectomy because they always associate this technology and this technique to higher chance of having troubles, having complications. 
do you have your uh, what is your opinion about that yeah for sure you can get in trouble while doing a rollerblader but that is not only because uh, it's a difficult procedure if you do it step by step and you know how to do it you're confident with this technique uh, you might not get into trouble, but sometimes uh, complications come from uh, the particular setting you're in. We are dealing with uh, special patients, with fragile patients. Most of the times they are elderly, they have heavily calcified vessels, not only their coronary arteries, but also the access is important. We are dealing with tortuous vessels, and this is, of course, a complex anatomy uh, in which complications might occur. Again, the whole thing about it is being prepared, being prepared to recognize calcification, being prepared to use the right tools, which in most cases include rot rotational arterectomy, and being prepared for complications uh, to immediately recognize them and treat them appropriately. That's right. Actually, you made very clear your case, and I thank you very much for sharing your opinion and experience. I think we have learned a lot of things, tips and tricks in the management of uh, heavily calcified coronary stenosis, the first important uh, take home message, at least for me, is that rely on coronary angiography, but don't fully rely on it in the sense that sometimes heavily calcified coronary lesions might also be undetected. Therefore, you might sometimes underestimate the severity of the disease and you might get in trouble. That is the first take for me. The second one is that once you identified your uh, problem, your heavily calcified coronary stenosis, there are specific tools and techniques that you can adapt and you can apply to this kind of problem to successfully revascularize the patient. But always keep in mind that in case your first strategy does not get through, be prepared to switch to an alternative strategy and most importantly, be prepared to handle potential complications that might arise not just because you're using a more complex technology, simply because you are dealing with a more complex patient. So, as far as I'm concerned, I understood from the colleagues and friends here that we need to be patient, we need to be knowledgeable of the technology and the techniques we are using, and we also need to be flexible in terms of adapting our strategy as the procedure goes on. For those of you who are really interested into this topic, I invite you to go on PCR Edu Online, where we specifically developed an online course, a web course that you can follow dealing with this uh, issue, dealing with the specific technique to be applied. And I thank you very much, uh, Joost and Fabio, to kindly uh, be with us. Thank you.